see you all again for the third talk in Gleanings from the Desert. Is this too loud or is it just me that I'm hearing myself? So we, so we talked over the last few weeks about a number of different subjects. The first week that we spoke, that we discussed, was about thoughts and how the Desert Fathers talk about thoughts and how to resist every thought and subdue every thought as quick as we possibly can and replace it with that thoughts that give life, thoughts that encourage. And then St. Abuna Paul, St. Paul, Abuna Paul spoke last week about refusing to judge your neighbor. And what have we been doing this whole series? We've been focusing on the writings and the teachings of the desert fathers and mothers and taking gleanings from the desert because what we talked about early is this theme verse, when we get the PowerPoint up, the theme verse is stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old past, paths where the good way is and walk in it and then you will find rest for your souls. So the, the, the ways of the past, the walks of the past, the journeys of those who came before us are journeys that are wise, journey that they, journeys that have taught us so much. And if we choose to glean from the desert and grab from the desert, there are many things that we can learn. Oh, it's not mirroring. Sorry. This is what happens when you're a rookie abuna. You don't know the, the seller Mac Mini? Let's see if it's... Ah, there it is. Big hand for the AV team. Big, big hand, big hand, big hand for the AV team. These guys, by the way, are the hidden, the hidden treasures of the church because without these guys, we're not able to do anything. We can't produce anything. We can't distribute things amongst the whole world. I found out last week, actually, guys, this is amazing, that last month, last month, 1.5 million minutes of sermons from Orthodox Sermons, St. Mark's DC, was streamed last, last month. Last month, 1.5 million minutes. That's amazing. It's amazing to see the word of the Lord being spread all over the earth and the things that this church is doing and the amazing servants that are behind the scenes making it happen are the reason why so many people are able to hear the gospel and hear the messages that the Lord wants to share. So we said the theme verse of this series is thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, ask for the old paths, paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. So the people of the old days and of the modern era think that old means bad, old means not good. But we've been saying, actually, the ancient paths are the paths that we ought to walk in because these desert fathers and mothers have so many things that they want to teach us. So today we're going to be talking about Death and life. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're going to be talking about death and life being in the power of the tongue. We're going to be talking about the tongue today, about speaking, about speech, and how the power that we have in this little organ that actually does so much good and so much bad in the world. Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. How many of us have used our words so many times and wish that we could hold things that we've said before back, or we could rewind, or we could have like an instant replay and figure out what we could have said differently. So many of us, our tongue ends up getting us into trouble. So today we want to focus on how the desert fathers and mothers learned to control their tongue and learned to use their tongue as a means of giving life to people. St. James says something really beautiful. He says, if any among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue or hold his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is what? Useless. Powerful. Anyone who calls themselves a believer, anyone who comes to church on Sunday, anyone who does all these different things but doesn't know how to restrain his or her tongue, their religion is useless. That's scary. I don't know about you, but that actually put, I'm, I'm, I'm what they call an Arabic kalamengi. You know, you guys know that expression, like a, a, a chatterbox. You know, the kind of person that when you get into a conversation, you can tell story after story after story. And I've had to learn over the years how to, sometimes my wife would actually tell me, she'd say, 
you suck all the oxygen out of the room. There's no, but there's no ability for somebody to breathe when you're in here. So sometimes what I've learned now is my wife is like a little bit of, so if she like taps me on the leg or something like that when we're in a gathering, I know to shh. Give other people an opportunity to talk. But hopefully my words are giving people life. But even sometimes life-giving words can hinder someone else from the opportunity of speaking, right? Like maybe there's something that I can learn from somebody else if I learn to shut my mouth, right? So it's, but it's not shutting my mouth for the sake of shutting my mouth. And this is where we need as a church community to understand what the desert fathers and mothers want us to learn. But before we get started, there's this story of this very rich man that went to his cook and said, I need you to prepare for me a really beautiful dish, something really yummy. So all of a sudden, the, the cook went out and got a pig's tongue, and he chopped it off, and then he left it on a plate and served it to the master. So the master was like, what's, what is this? Like, what, what's, what's going on here? I'm like a rich man. You're supposed to be serving me and doing all these things. How are you going to produce for me a tongue? He said, actually, I brought you out the best dish. It's the best dish because with your tongue, I wanted to remind you, Master, with your tongue, you may bless and communicate happiness, dispel sorrow, remove despair, cheer the faint-hearted, inspire the discouraged, and say a hundred other things to lift up mankind. He's like, are you trying to teach me a lesson? He goes, all right, what's the worst dish then? So he went back to the kitchen, and he came back with the same plate. And he said... A dish of tongue, because it's, it is also the worst dish at the same time, because with it we may curse, break human hearts, destroy reputations, promote discord and strife, set families, communities, and nations at war with each other. And the master said, you are a wise servant. What is this story telling us? It's basically telling us what, what St. James says in the book of James. With it, we can bless, and with it, we can curse. With it, we can give life, and with it, we can speak death. With it, we can encourage, but it's the same two-edged sword. With it, we can hurt so many people. So how do we, as a church community, learn to like? Abba Agathon says, No passion is worse than an uncontrolled tongue, because it is the mother of all passions. It is the mother of all struggles, because with your tongue, you can set so many things ablaze. Abba Arsenius, one of the desert fathers, in fact, he wanted to learn to restrain his tongue. So what he would do is he put a pebble underneath his tongue. So every time he was about to speak, he would be reminded of, hold on, let me think about what I'm about to speak. I recently chipped the back of my tooth. So now every time I'm speaking, I feel like there's something wrong with how I'm speaking. I feel like almost I have a lisp or something. So what it is, is it's a, a, there's a constant reminder that there's something wrong. There's something weird going on in my mouth. Like, it, I can't figure out what's going on. Thank God we have good dentists in this church that are going to help me out. Um, but Abba Arsenius was so intent on protecting his tongue that he put a rock in his mouth. That every single time he was about to speak, this is the level and the extent that he was willing to take in order to understand how powerful this little organ is. While sti still living, Abba Arsenius, by the way, his background was he used to teach like highly, highly educated people in the emperor's palace. So when he was living in the palace, Abba Arsenius prayed to God and said, Lord, lead me in the way of sal salvation. And a voice came to him saying, Arsenius... Flee from men and you will be saved. And then having withdrawn to the solitary life, he made the same prayer again and heard a voice saying, Arsenius, flee, be silent, pray always, for these are the sources of sinlessness. Now you may say, all right, that's like really beautiful for a desert father. It's really beautiful. How do I apply that to, that to my life? But what he is saying here, or what this story is telling us, is the way forward in learning how to control our tongue is actually backwards. And we have a modern day context of this in basketball. You guys know that basketball players sometimes, or football players, sometimes, but specifically basketball players. You see that guy in the picture over there? That's Steph Curry. He's considered one of the greatest shooters in the NBA. Now, how did Steph Curry get to be 
as great of a shooter that he is. He worked with that guy standing next to him. That was his shooting coach. And what these shooting coaches do is sometimes a basketball player thinks that his shot is perfect, but the way for his shot to actually be perfected is they have to rebuild from the ground up, almost reteach a person how to shoot a basketball again. And the same thing happens when a college football player or a quarterback ends coming into the NFL. What happens? When he comes into the NFL, he thinks he's like the best. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He's like the best football player that it is. But when he comes to the NFL, he's with the big boys now. He has to modify his game. He has to learn how to play the game differently. So what the coaches do is he'll meet a quarterback coach and he'll say, everything that you ever knew, we need to, we need to destroy and we need to rebuild back better. And that's what we have to do with our tongue. The way forward is actually backward. The way we sort of learn how to use our tongue appropriately is actually figuring out what's the root that causes us to speak badly about people or to gossip or to think that we are the smartest person and type a lot. Sometimes it's not just with the tongue, it's with your fingers, right? Like social media, we have the social media warriors all over our church and in many other places all over the world. We love the social media warriors. But so many of us think that it's just with our tongue. Our fingers on social media have the same power to destroy and to give people life as well. King Solomon says, to everything there is a season, right? So this is the season today. Every single one of us, we need to be honest with God and say to him, Lord, I have my shortcomings with my tongue. I know I've hurt people before. I know time and time again I've messed up. But Lord, how do I learn to use this to bless people? How do I learn to use this to praise you? How do I learn to use this to be a source of encouragement? A time for every purpose under heaven. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. I pray that every single one of us would look within ourselves today and say, we want to glean from the desert, but we want to break down. We want to do a speech overhaul. We want to go back to the basics and figure out what it is that causes me to speak the way that I speak. What is it that causes me to harm people? So before being able to speak again, we need to learn to be silent. Now, I'm not telling you that you're never going to speak again. I'm not saying that. I'm not telling you, you know, I, you guys remember that video where there was this Egyptian woman in Egypt and she was like, CCS, CCS, Morsi, no? You remember that video? And then after she said, shut up your mouth, Obama, shut up your mouth. I, 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 oh, I, every time I see that video or every time I'm about to speak, I think to myself, shut up your mouth, Obama, to myself. <laughs> this has nothing to do with politics. It's just I love the lady the way she says it. We need to shut up our mouths. We need to learn to be silent. St. Arsenio says something really beautiful. I've often repented of having spoken, but never having remained silent. Think about this, guys. Think about how so many times, if we were to just pause for three to five seconds before we say something, whether that be in relationships with family members, whether that be with how we speak to our kids, whether that be with how we speak to colleagues or friends, if three to five seconds we paused and we shh, how much of a difference that would cause. If we calculated, if we actually thought what it is that I want to say before I say it, how much of a difference would that make in the conflicts that we have with one another? Father John Brick, he says, silence is the pre prerequisite for inner stillness. The only inner stillness, only inner stillness enables us to truly listen to God, to hear his voice, and to commune with him in the depths of our being. What is this saying? It's basically saying it's not being silent for just being silent to shut my mouth. It's being silent to pause and to say, Lord, what, did it, what is it that you want me to say? What do you want me to do in this situation? How can I hear your voice before I start to just ramble away? In our society, we've thought that every single one of us have become like the master of all things. So we think we always have to give our opinion in all things. Like, if I don't give a, my opinion in every single circumstance, that means that I am like depriving the world of the, the intellect that I have. But the reality is, how many times so many of us, if we just don't speak, will do so much better for other people and for ourselves? 
But we're silent because what St. Arsenio said, I don't want to cause harm to other people. I don't want have to, to later on, I'll do a public confession, guys, I'm sorry. You know, this is the, my, my MO. One time I was sitting in a, in a, a talk like this, and there was like a Q&A. And I was sitting next to this person, and I don't remember this story, by the way, I really don't know. But somebody came and told me, like, you got to watch out what you're saying. And this person, somebody asked a question, and I was like, gosh, what a dumb question. <laughs> what a dumb question. And that person, for later on, I come to find that they really was the person sitting next to me was the person that asked the question. So, like, can you imagine? I'm sitting next to this person, and I'm thinking to myself, what a dumb question. But I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I didn't know till years later, years later, that this is what I did to this person. I'm, and I'm still embarrassed of the fact that I called this person's question dumb. Now, y'all are all saints, I'm sure. None of you have ever had an experience like that before, right? Nobody's ever, ever misspoken. I know of you guys, Zay Abuna, I'm a kid. How could Abuna speak like Y'all are all perfect. I know, I know. Being honest, confession. But if I just learned, shh. If I just said, maybe this person wants to learn something today, is genuinely asking this question out of not knowing. I've regretted many times speaking, many times. And the times where I've learned to be silent, I've learned the beauty and the wisdom of other people around me. So being, before, before being able to speak again, we need to learn to be silent. Struggling with my PowerPoint, guys. There we go. So silence teaches us three things, guys. Silence makes us pilgrims. And what does it mean? Abba Tithos says, pilgrimage means that man should control his tongue. To be on pilgrimage is to be silent. Expresses the conviction of the Desert Fathers that silence is the best anticipation of the future world. What is that saying here? Silence basically tells us that when I close my mouth, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, why am I closing my mouth? I'm closing my mouth for the sake of not harming people and for the sake of looking forward to the things to come. I don't want my tongue to be the reason why I find myself so far away from God. I don't want my tongue to be a means of hurting people. Closing my mouth allows me to await the life to come. Closing my mouth allows me to be in inner stillness with God to hear his voice. Closing my mouth teaches me not to harm people. Silence also teaches us to speak. When you, when you close your mouth, you learn the wisdom of when to speak or how to speak. But if you're constantly speaking, let me ask you a question. You know that person who's constantly speaking all the time? Do people listen to that person? Like the person that has an opinion about everything. Do people end up like, wow, please tell me more. Like, please, I want to hear your opinion. Like, I, you deprive me of your opinion. Please tell me more. No, most people, the person that doesn't speak is the person that when they speak, everybody's like, what is that? wow, what does that person say? I want to know what that person has to say. Because they're carefully calculating their words and coming up with words that will bring benefit to the group. Now, I want to talk on a side note about extroverted thinkers and introverted thinkers. You know, extroverted thinkers are the people that talk, and as they're talking, they're thinking. For y'all extroverted thinkers like me, talk with maybe one or two people about your thoughts. <laughs> it doesn't need to be a large group at all times about your thoughts. Bounce ideas with a trusted friend. And for the introverted thinkers, sometimes it's good to share what's going on inside so people know. Silence guards the fire within. When you are silent and when you don't quickly retaliate, what happens? When I'm so angry and I want to get somebody back for what they did. When I learn to shh, three to five seconds, take a deep breath. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It does what? It silences the fire within. I want to take what St. James says really quickly for us to really look at and understand the imagery that he uses. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. 
Look also at ships. Although they are so large, are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. So how great a forest, so how great a forest, a little fire, a spark kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Gosh, that is intense language. But look at the imagery that he uses. He uses the idea of a bit. Y'all know what a bit is? Is when a horse is being moved. This little tiny thing can direct the horse. Can move the horse if you want to move it faster. If you want to move the horse slower, if you want to move right, left, this little tiny bit directs the horse. A rudder. Y'all see that picture? Huge boat and this tiny little thing that sort of just does this directs where the boat goes. A spark. Y'all know the California forest fires that happened? You know where it started from? A hammer. A spark from a hammer. A spark from a hammer set the California forest fires ablaze. Thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of land burnt to a crisp because of a spark. You see the imagery that St. James is using here about the power of the tongue? That the, pow- the tongue can move this strong horse. The tongue can move this huge ship. The tongue can set ablaze a forest that's thousands of acres long. So the scripture tells us in James chapter 3, the power of this little tiny organ. All right, so now let's get to the how. So we talked about silence, but the Desert Fathers also talk about this concept of fleeing. A brother asked or questioned Abba Mateus, saying, what am I to do? My tongue makes me suffer. And every time I go among men, I cannot control it, but I condemn them in all the good they are doing and reproach them with it. What am I to do? The old man replied, If you cannot contain yourself, flee into solitude, for this is a sickness. He who dwells with brethren must not be a square, but round, so as to turn himself towards all. He went on, it is not through virtue that I live in solitude, but through weakness. Those who live in the midst of men are the strong ones. Powerful story. Let's contextualize it for us. Abba Macarius was dismissing some brothers from the assembly when he said, flee my brothers. Confused, one of them returned. Where could we flee beyond this desert? We've already fleed. We've already in solitude. Macarius put a finger on his lips and said, flee that. So fleeing is not fleeing into solitude. Fleeing is not fleeing from separating myself from humans. Fleeing is contextualized for us. The modern day fleeing is not always needing to give your opinion. Fleeing is reducing complaining at every opportunity. Fleeing is not speaking evil against my brother and sister. Fleeing is disengaging from arguing on social media. Fleeing is all of those things and more. But let's go through step by step of each of those. Not always needing to give your opinion. Hypercheous. Did I pronounce that right? Did I think I did a good job with that? Hypercheous. Said, He who teaches others by his life and not his speech is truly wise. Abbas Joseph said to Abba Nisterius. What should I do? Sorry, that was the next parrot. What should I do about my tongue, for I cannot control it? The old man said, when you speak, do you find peace? He replied, no. The old man said, if you do not find peace, why do you speak? Be silent, and when a conversation takes place, it is better to listen than to speak. This is the, the Desert Fathers, guys. Desert Fathers basically telling us, don't always give your opinion. You don't always, not everybody needs to know what you have to say about everything at all times. You learn so much. And I said this to the servants a few months ago. But this is truly, truly, truly something that I think every single one of us need to work on. It's, not, it's learning the wisdom of when to give my opinion. I'm not saying to never give your opinion. I'm not saying that your opinion isn't needed. But if you have an opinion about everything, then maybe you have to ask yourself, is there something that I need to learn? Is there something that I need to learn from other people? Or have I set myself above everybody that I think I know it all? 
Reduce complaining at every opportunity. How many of us have met somebody, and when you talk to them, the moment you say, how are you, all of a sudden the floodgates open. And you're like, wow, wow, that's a lot. And they complain about their mother, their sister, their brother, their family, their coworkers, their colleagues, etc. A person who complains is like a person who has bad breath. Nobody wants to be around them. Honestly, somebody who has bad breath and somebody sitting next to you, you want to keep your distance from that person because all they do is they complain. You want your tongue to be used as a means of, and I'm not saying it's okay to some to share your struggles with other people. I'm not saying, let's not jump to the extremes. But if you are constantly complaining at all times about every circumstance in your life, then it's likely that maybe your, your perspective is off. Maybe there's something that's not calibrated appropriately. Maybe there's something that needs to be redirected. So on a, hu a human level, you att attend to attract people who are like you. So if you're a complainer, you're going to attract complaining people, and you're going to complain with one another because misery likes company, right? But if you're a person that tends to be the person that gives life to people and encourages other people, you're going to draw around you people that like to be encouraged. This is a great story for the realtors out there. There was a family looking for a, a house, and there was a picky family, right? And they asked the, the, fam, the realtor, what is this neighborhood like? What are the people like? So he asked them, well, in your old home, what were, their, what were your neighbors like? And they responded, they were terrible people. They were blah, 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 criticized, criticized, criticized. And he said, well, the people that are here are going to be just like your old neighbors. Why? Because the person who sees the problem in everything is the problem. With all due respect, if all we're doing is constantly criticizing someone, maybe it's time for me to take a step back and say, is there something that I need to work on? Is there something within me that needs to change? Is it maybe my lens by which I'm seeing this situation? So reduce the complaining. Learn, again, me too. People are asking me, how's priesthood these days? And my, my response is like, I'm like, it's awesome. But, you know, I'm not, you know, but. But what I've learned, I'm trying. If you see me saying the but, say, shh, abuna. Don't say the but. Do you know the but? You guys know that? You guys remember that? Don't use the but. Don't use the Pause. Not speaking evil of my brother or sister. Do not, let anyone, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Again, this is the problem of communities. The problem with communities that are so close, that are so in each other's lives and business, is that it's really easy to gossip in the name of righteousness. Abuna, you know, people sit down with me, Abuna, you know this person and this person and this person and this person. Like, are you here to talk about yourself or are you here to talk about the other people? It's easy to speak evil in a righteous way. Abuna, did you hear about that person's marriage? We need to pray about that. You know, Abuna, we need to, you know. Did you share this with anyone else? Oh, yeah, I spoke to this servant and this servant and this person and this person. Abuna, did you hear about this person's kid? Yeah, Habib, sh sh shut up your mouth. Shut up, shut, up, shut up your mouth. Wholesome talk needs to come out of our mouths, building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Wholesome words to lift people up, to say, to be that person who goes to those people and encourages them and supports them. Don't mind Henny, he's doing the videos for, for a campaign that we're doing at church, so don't be distracted by him. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. I'm watching. Anyone who looks at Hanny, I'm going to be like a, like a sword with a cross right in your, between your eyes. <laughs> when you think something good, say it. When you live for it for 30 seconds, you get used to it. It's an old famous quote. When you think something good, say it. But when you live with it for 30 seconds, you get used to it. The, the, the mystery of not speaking evil against your brother, is if you literally take 30 seconds, most times you won't harm people. Most times you'll think to yourself, 
What is my motive for sharing this with somebody else? Is it genuinely to build others up or is it genuinely because I have nothing better to talk about? You know how many people are telling me I don't have anything to talk about my friends with? Like I have no conversation, so all we do is talk about other people. Well, there is sports, there are museums, there is literature. You know the problem with all of us is we don't do anything besides each other. Like we don't do anything except talk to each other. Go out, read books, see th interesting things in literature, go to museums, learn new things, share it with one another. Don't be this. If this is all we got, all we're going to do is talk about each other's business. So it's important to grow as humans so that we can share things with one another that build each other up. Turn the heart towards God. This is from one of the desert mothers, Ama Theodora. The same Ama was asked about the conversations one here. So she's, she's talking about what do we do when we're in the middle of these conversations. If one is habitually listening to secular speech, how can one live for God alone, as you suggest? She said, just as when you are sitting at a table and there are many courses, you take some but without pleasure. So when secular conversations come your way, have your heart turned towards God. And thanks to this disposition, you will hear them without, ple without pleasure, and they will not do you any harm. What is this saying here? It's basically saying if you're in the middle of a conversation and somebody starts to gossip, if you turn and orient your heart to God, and you say, Lord, how can I change the subject? How can I bring a source of life from you to this person? How can I be encouragement? How can I lift up in this moment? you'll start to see that this conversation won't actually have any impact on you. You won't walk away and be thinking about the gossip that you just heard. You'll be thinking about when you're sitting, how can I actually remove the plank from my own eye before I start to look around and judge others? Buna Paul was talking about that last week. This is a big one. Disengaging from arguing on social media. And glory be to God. <laughs> We do not need words only, for at the present time there are many words among men. Is that not relevant? But we need works, for this is what is required, not works, words which do not bear fruit. We have a lot of talkers, a lot of people that have opinions about everything, about how the world should govern, about which government should take over in this country, about which politician should be this. We have so many perspectives. Which abuna is this and which... Who asked for your opinion? Who asked for your opinion? Seriously. And why, does every, why at any moment do you need to give your opinion in all things? Take a second and ask yourself, we're about to write a tweet or write to comment or write thumbs down or when this bishop gets a doctoral dissertation from a Catholic university and then you want to go online and say, he's a heretic because he engages with the Catholics. Ya Habibi. Who made you the defender of the faith? Who made you the defender of the faith? You're above a metropolitan of the Coptic Orthodox Church. You have risen to his level. You're above the patriarch of Alexandria. Ya yeah, Habibi, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Shut up your mouth, Obama. Now that's going to be on Facebook this evening. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. I guarantee you they're going to destroy me this evening. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a rookie, I'm a rookie. <laughs> Abu Suyis once said with confidence, for 30 years, I have not prayed to God without sin. When I pray, I say, Lord Jesus Christ, protect me from my tongue. Even now, it causes me to fall every day. How many of us actually pray for our tongue? How many of us actually pray that the Lord would give us a tongue that speaks life to people? How many of us actually, before we start each day, say, Lord, give me words of life to speak to people? Lord, let me be a means of encouragement. Lord, that person who's in darkness, hurting, in pain, that person who has no friends, that person who's alone, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Today, all of y'all are going to be quiet in your households. 
So when your wife wants to talk to you, don't say, ah, Abuna told me I don't have to talk. <laughs> or when your husband says, Habibti, I want to share something with you. No, ah, Abuna told me not. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a wisdom and a how, the intent of why we talk. If we just ask ourselves the question why for everything we do, it will save us a lot of pain. But this is a marathon, not a sprint. Marathon, you have to train for a long period of time because it's an endurance race. A sprint, you just got to get on that start line and you got to go. And you burn out quickly. I love what St. Macarius says here. Most people want to gain the kingdom without sweat and effort. This is from a desert father, by the way. He's talking about sweat and effort. Talk about relevance, right? Not the other. But I genuinely, Lord, want to be a person who speaks life into people. I genuinely want, Lord, to be a person who my words, when people listen to it, they see Jesus. They see Jesus. Their wor the words that I speak, speak life. We have in this room about like 300 people, would you say? Maybe give or take. Imagine 300 people. They go out into the community today and they're sources of encouragement. They speak life into one another. When somebody's down, when somebody's hurting, we're that voice of encouragement. Imagine 300 people in their workplaces when there's conflict amongst the work, their coworkers. What the people of God are able to do, how many wars will be stopped by us? By just our presence. Wars in our family, wars in our jobs, wars in our communities. How many wars will be stopped? How many murders will cease to happen? I'm not talking about physical murders. I'm talking about murder of the heart. When I hate somebody and I genuinely want to do something to harm them, how many murders will be stopped if we just... I pray that every single one of us today would recognize that with the same mouth that we take communion with, with the same mouth that Jesus chooses to dwell and enter, that's the same mouth that we have the opportunity to bless others with. St. John Chrysostom says a really beautiful quote. He says, those who've received the Eucharist should be like lions with fire coming out of their mouth. That wherever they go, the fire and the love of Jesus is shared with every single person they encounter. I pray that our tongues would be tongues of life, not tongues of death. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.